So what's the problem with passwords? Right? The, the problem with passwords is that the most passwords that we choose have a pretty low complexity or low entropy in scientific terms. And what that basically means is they're easy to guess. Um, these were, um, so every year there's quite a few passwords that are leaked um, through various companies. And there's quite a few people that then kind of analyze these passwords to kind of figure out which passwords are most used. And these are the top 10. Does anybody see that password on here? <laughs> you should probably go and fix that. You can see Adobe had a leak in 2012, uh, and Adobe made it into the top 10 as a, as a word in the uh, top 10 of 2013. Now, actually the top 10 I don't really care about that much, because I think the people that have those passwords, they probably have different life problems than their password. But the thing from these statistics that I'm interested in is that bottom one. See, 91% of us, 91% of us, only use 1,000 passwords. So when we're talking about dictionary attacks, we're not talking about dictionary attacks, we're talking about flyer attacks, right? Just the back page, maybe like the last two pages out of a dictionary we're using, we need to use to actually crack a password. So that's a problem. Um, is anybody using one password? Like an app? I love it. It's great, it, you know, it allows me to make absolutely random passwords for every different website, a different one which is great, but again, it's not great for mobile. Um, they actually have a pretty good mobile app, uh, and I actually use that to then browse websites through their app, because they actually make it easy to log into things. But it's kind of a hack, right? It's kind of a solution, because we don't have a better solution. The other problem with passwords is this. Who here uses a different password for every, literally every website? Every website, there's not one website where you haven't used your password again? Yeah, maybe one, two people in a room of, say, 100. Which means that when a password database leaks, right, you can easily see, you, you know, I can easily, as a hacker, I can go and look up your email address and then try that email address on every other website. So instead of the security being related to just your website, the security is related to all the other websites, which means that all the websites in the, in the entire internet need to be secured together. It's never going to happen. So, some interesting stats. Um, this is a little survey that I, it was done, and, and you know, the majority of the people wants to log in online with a social login, because it means they don't have to set a username and password. And actually, quite a large percentage of them if they forgot what the username and password is, they, they don't even try to log in again. They don't try and reset that password, they'll just leave. Which if you're trying to run a business, that's not, that's not particularly good for you, right? So what kind of, let's talk a bit about identity. So there's a couple of different kinds of identity. We have Twitter, Facebook, we all know these. And then we have maybe a bit more specific, we have our login with LinkedIn, login with GitHub. Who here has, a login, has ever logged in with GitHub? Cool. Spot the developers in the room. Um, and, you know, PayPal has its own login system too. And the way I like to think about these is in kind of like different kind of identities that you have, right? So, your Facebook and your Twitter, even though, you know, on Facebook and my Twitter, my details are pretty accurate. Um, you know, my cat could have a Twitter account, right? which means that if somebody logs in with Twitter, you know, you, you might know that it's Kitty47, but whether or not that's an actual person, you have no idea. So it's not your anonymous identity. You get to pick whatever you want to be. Well, your GitHub and your LinkedIn logins, those are a bit more like, um, like your dating profiles, right? They're, they're how you want to present yourself to the interested parties. Um, you're probably gonna have a lot more hair uh, you're probably going to be a lot smarter and fitter, and you're going to probably be a lot more interesting. Well, in the end, you know, you also have your bank accounts, and that's kind of the login with PayPal, right? This is your actual identity. I call this your concrete identity. These are the credentials that you use to actually prove who you really are. Because you've got to think, your bank knows who you really are, because if your bank doesn't know who you really are, your salary is not going to come into your account, right? 
So you want to make sure that that's up to date. You want to make sure that your address is up to date. So we have a login with PayPal, which allows you to log into other websites and give other websites permissions to actually look at these details. And we have some interesting details in there, like your name, your email, where you live, which is the stuff that you can get from Facebook and Twitter. We actually don't have your friends. Sorry, this is from a different slide back. I forgot to take that out. Um, but you know, we know your address. But the most interesting thing that we have is we can tell you whether or not your address is verified, whether or not your bank account is verified, and whether or not you have a business account or a regular account. This is very cool. Like some products, you only want to have businesses log in. We can provide that. Now, because we have all these details, we want to make sure that, of course, all these details are absolutely secure. So how do you ensure security? How do you ensure that somebody is who they say they are? So something you know, something you have, and something you are are generally the things that you need to identify yourself. So let's look at like traditional methods of identifying yourself. There's the password field, right? Which is, sorry, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. So there's something you, you have, uh, so, so there's something you know is your password or your username. It's that thing that is very mutable. It's something that's in your head. You can change it, right? You have the something you have, which is your phone or your passport or your watch or anything else that you have. And then you have the something you are, which is your physical properties, your face, what you look like, your iris scan, your fingerprint, your heartbeat. So when we look at like traditional methods of identifying ourselves, in a border patrol, what do we do there, right? We have the something you have, which is your passport, and then we have the something you are, which is the thing you look like. And then the border control agent makes sure that you actually look like the thing it says on your passport, and then they let you into the country or not. Occasionally, they might ask you questions, uh, which is kind of not something you know, and you might ask them at multiple points in the process just to make sure that you constantly are the same person. But in general, that's how you, you know border controls work. And then we have like traditional logins, and traditional logins are really bad because the only thing that we're really asking for is two times something you know, where the username quite often everybody knows. I'm C beta and I'm C beta everywhere. Except for in Yahoo because I was too late. <laughs> oh sorry, on Instagram. Really annoys me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm C beta everywhere. So really all we're asking for is one thing you know and nothing else. This is a really low security level, right? So in recent years what we've started to do is kind of two factor authentication. It's this idea of adding something you have into the picture. So either you get an SMS to that thing you have in your pocket all the time, um, or something like Google Authenticator or any of the other products that just has a random, random number that shows up and you have to type that in. So that works pretty well. We've also seen like the something you are, which is the fingerprint reader, especially the one from Apple's pretty popular and they've now open up the SDK so you can actually start using it in your own apps, which is going to be pretty, we're going to see that in so many apps. Uh, I bet you we're going to probably bring that into PayPal too, so you can pay with in the PayPal app just by scanning your finger. So much opportunity for so many other things to use the same technology, right? This is a company called uh, Nini, I'm assuming you pronounce it. Um, and they make this bracelet which measures your heartbeat. And it turns out that independent of how high your heartbeat, your rate is, you, the signature of your heartbeat, so the kind of the distance between the different pulses, is quite unique and can actually help you identify yourself. Now connect that to your phone, you can do interesting things. And of course we all have like, you know, well, you know, there's a whole lot of people that have these like other things around their wrists. So we're having more and more devices around their wrists. Actually, um, I forgot to replace this with a picture of the, um, the Samsung Gear watches, they actually have a, uh, under the, on the inside of the, 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 the watch, it actually has a um, uh, heartbeat monitor, which is meant for like if you go running, then you can kind of put it into running mode and you can 
and measure your heartbeat while we're running. But of course, that will allow you to do identify yourself too. So it's a way in commercial watches that are actually there, not just as a gimmick for people to use to you know, measure the heartbeat, but things that people will be wearing for other reasons. Ah, yeah, there it is. Um, I seem to have turned on the laser point. Oh, off. <laughs> um, so, when we talk about identity, and when we talk about securing these information details, we realize that we need something new, right? We need something that's a bit more higher level than just a username and password. So, we've been working together with quite a few other companies. Uh, we've worked with Google, Samsung, um, I think Microsoft is involved. There's a couple of other, I think IBM is involved in this. On this thing called Fido. Now, Fido is not a little bell. It's, um, it's a technology that stands for Fast Identity Online. And what it does is it allows you to, it's kind of a protocol that we're trying to develop that helps you kind of have a uniform way of doing authentication online using these kind of technologies like fingerprints, irises, etc. So the way that it works is, the way that it works is that the first time that you, let's say you have a mobile device, the first time that you log in, you go through a lot of trouble. You go through a lot of steps. So you have to log in with your email, username, and password, or maybe even not with your username and password. Like if a company knows your email, you could just say, hey, I'm bought by the example.com, please log me in. And they will send you an email, you open the email, and then you also get a text message, you type in the, the code, and then you also need to scan your fingerprint and verify that. And then you're logged in. But then the idea, what it does is it will store a, which is step number three, it will store a secure token on your device, which is basically a, a public key or a private key. doesn't matter. It's one of the two keys that you have. And it's stored on your device, which is basically a really long random password that is really hard to guess, but it's tied to your device. It's tied to that device, to your account, for you. Which means that if you have three phones and a laptop and a tablet, each one of these devices will have a different token. Which again is the, you know, the repeated ability removed. And they're really long, they're really complex. This is a high entropy. All good. Now, of course, you want to make sure that not somebody can't just use this when they get to your device. So what it does is you can encrypt that key itself with your fingerprint or your heartbeat or anything else. So you have this secure token on your device that you only can unlock with your finger. Now, of course, your finger is a bit of a, you know, it's not a super high security, but you've already gone through all these steps to kind of prove that this is indeed your device. So just kind of for these repeat logins, you don't need that kind of security. So how does an actual login work then? So you come to a website, they bring up the plugin, they ask you to log in, it finds the key, it sees, hey, that key is locked. You put your finger on the scanner, on the, on the fingerprint scanner, you unlock the key, it sends the key to the server, or it sends a, an encrypted token you created with the key to the server, and it tells the server, hey, I'm Bob, log me in. So the thing that Fido does is that kind of, it specifies that cryptographic protocol in the middle, and it kind of has a pluggable local authentication framework. So it's a system that at some point will just be built into mobile phones, where you as a developer can kind of say, okay, I want to encrypt this key with my heartbeat. I want to encrypt this thing with my iris. I want to encrypt this thing with, you know, what the person looks like, just facial recognition. Or I just don't want to encrypt it, I just want to have that key on my device. You can choose the different kind of levels of security depending on the environment. And it's all on the client side, it's not a server side implementation. So you can find more of this in FidoAlliance.org. Um, I highly recommend you have a look at it, it's pretty awesome. Um, you can actually use it already on the um, Samsung Galaxy S5. So on the Samsung S5, you can actually get the PayPal app and actually pay on websites 
that have not done any extra integration for this, you can actually pay with your fingerprint. The only thing it requires you to do is to one good time go through that authentication process, get that token put on your device, and then from that moment on the money, you just go shop online, swap your finger, and you've paid. So let's paint you a picture of the future. Um, to go back to what I was talking about before, um, at, the, at my previous talk, I can imagine that you walk into the shop, right? Into an actual retail store. You, um, I'm not sure if I had another slide. No. Um, you walk into a retail store, you show your face to the counter, you say, hey, I want to pay. You know, you pick up the, the item that you want, you say, I want to pay for this. They see you on their terminal, they recognize your face as something you are. The something you have is your phone, it has checked you in. It asks you, hey, they find you, sorry, they find you on their terminal, they click on it, they say, okay, it's like, it's like five euro, pay, goes back to your phone, which connects with your watch, which has a heartbeat monitor in it. It actually confirms whether or not you are wearing the watch just as an actual extra security level. It then locks you in, it verifies the payment, and you've paid. You've not taken your phone out of your pocket, you've not taken your wallet out of your pocket, and I tell you, it's more secure than just tapping your cart on a device and walking out. So to me, that's the future. The future is going to be a lot more secure through these kind of technologies, and I hope you all look into it and talk about it, because the only way we're going to get it is by sharing it with everybody, all the other developers, and actually talk about it. And let's hope that it means that we can actually start you know, destroying a lot of these post-it notes on everybody's laptops, because we don't need them anymore. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, in the back. Hello? Oh, there we go. Um, really, really interesting talk. Um, the, the only, I suppose, uh, problem I have is that I use a password manager, uh, LastPass, which is like one password, and I always think, what happens if someone gets the password to my password manager? And with some of the biometrics, I think, well, you know, if, if this thing is, you know, it's unique to me, if someone can record my fingerprint or my heartbeat, what if you know that's the key to let them in? So I, I, I just wonder how many factors of authentication are enough to be both sort of really secure, but also not, um, but, but but still useful as well. So the I mean to me the I think the future is that we're not going to use passwords, right? The, the way to do it is to get rid of passwords that we remember, right? So there's already some websites that are experimenting with this where you you don't actually log in. Instead, you just give them your email address, they send you a link to your email address because you're already using your email address as that unique identifier. So it's kind of it's kind of offloading this, um, this burden of fraud protection to, say, Google, because Google does a lot of fraud protection for you on, on your behalf then. Of course, that still puts the burden on with Google, so you might still add a two-factor authentication on top of that to make sure that your phone is actually with you too. Now the way FIDO, kind of the FIDO implementation does that is that you know it's all open to the developer to kind of demand what kind of level of security you want. So the idea is that you can spend a lot of time kind of the first time to kind of go through that process of doing like four, five, six steps and then encrypt it on your phone with that really unique key. And a unique key is unique to your phone which means that it can be revoked, right? And then you have to go, you have to start up again, you have to go through the process again. So even if I have your fingerprint, you know, the moment that I realize that I have access to your phone, uh, the moment that you realize that I have access to your phone with your fingerprint, I can start removing that phone from, from, the, uh, from my um, authorized devices. You're never going to be 100% secure, you're only going to limit it down by every extra factor that you add on top. So the other thing, the other thing is that your fingerprint is never in this process. Your fingerprint is never used as a direct authentication method, right? It's just used as a way to encrypt 
you know, to add that le extra little layer of encryption on top of this key that's on this device that you've already proven is yours, etc., etc., etc. So to, you know, if somebody steals your fingerprint, sure, but then they also need your device. They need a right device. They can probably only use it once because then you'll revoke that device. So that person with that malicious intent is not going to get very, very far. So that's kind of the reasoning around that. And the great thing is it's not unlike a password, it's not something that once I have it, once I have that one phone, I can use that token to log in on all your other devices. I can't. Any other questions? Wait a second, you get a microphone. Hello. Uh, just a question of, from a different point of view. Let's say someone, somebody steals your phone, but not to steal your money. You just lose your phone. What is the trouble to be able to change that authenticator? I mean, if you say my phone would authenticate me and I lost it, how do I revoke that phone because I'm so, not me so, anymore? So with every, with every service, the, the key is um, implemented both on the server side and on the client side. So on the client, so on your mobile phone, there's one key and it's a, it's a asymmetrical encryption, so public-private key process. So the public or whatever, one of the keys is on your phone and the other key is with the service. And that service will have attached to your account multiple keys. And the only thing it really has to do is just you, you go in the same way you can do with Google and say, hey, I want to revoke that device from my, from my services. So you can go in and say, hey, please remove this device. So it's on the server side. The, the file is not tied to, to mobile phones. This is a technology stack that's built for any device, for browsers, for phones, for watches. It's, it's, a, it's a stack independent, a stack agnostic solution. I see, so I would need to use my fingerprint on my desktop PC as well after I lose my phone. No, so, so the, 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 the method of encrypting the, kind of the, if you go back to this picture, so that kind of pluggable um, local authentication that's a local choice and a local uh, solution. So as a provider, so as a website, I can say, okay, I require a certain level, but I can leave it to the device to actually guarantee that in the way that it wants to do that. So on your laptop, I might require, you know, a password and a this and a that and a that. Where on your phone, I might say, okay, I need your heartbeat and your fingerprint. So it's independent of whatever device is actually trying to do this. I see, thank you. I think this will be the, okay. the last question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. If uh, all my keys are stored in a uh, FIDO server, a central server, where I um, set my devices with different uh, security measures, and somebody hacks my um, FIDO account, for example, and they delete uh, all my um, devices, which I have uh, added. And then I will uh, I will be left with only my password and, uh, and um, no other way to connect uh, to different websites. Or what assures me that uh, that server will, will not be hacked or something like that? Okay. So first of all, the so it's not the FIDO server. It's the, the FIDO is not a server, but let's say. Twitter uses this technology, right? And let's say Twitter gets hacked. This is actually a pretty good solution because, sure, they can delete all your keys, but they, the, the keys on themselves are useless, right? The keys are just one factor. They're, they're two asymmetrical keys. It's not like a, only a security issue. I will be left without a possibility yeah. from, from connecting with my devices. From my still, devices. You still have your email address. You know, and you still have you still have other solutions of logging in. Um, you still might have a backup password. You still have your phone number, right? They can still send you a text message. So I can still do this thing where I log in through, say, I give them my email address. They send me an email. I click on the link. They send me a token over text, right? And I'm logged in again. So I have to. Um, this is all to retake all the steps for adding my devices. You have to you have to go through all the steps again to add your device. But to be honest, I I prefer any service to have FIDO versus not FIDO because 
the alternative is that they have my password hashed, and the majority of the websites do a really bad job at this and don't hash them properly, or they don't hash them at all, or they don't sort them, which means you end up with a leaked database with lots of lots of records, with lots of email addresses and passwords. And the point is, if a website is hacked, you know, the cat is out of the bag anyway. So at that moment, I wish there's as little, as little information on their actual servers, which means I don't actually want them to have my password. And I definitely don't want them to have a password that I have somewhere else. So that's the point of the story. Okay, thank you. Cheers.